I guess you can see that Mesa really did hit the mark with their Mark series. Hello everyone, how is it going? I am Lucas and we are going to be diving deep into the history of the Mesa Mark series. We're going to look at the very beginnings before the Mark 1 was even built and then we're going to be looking into the future of the Mark series. I'm going to be going over a bunch of different things when we're talking about the Mark series. The amp's going to be talking about dates and design structures and things of that nature. I probably will get a few things wrong, so if I do, definitely let me know in the comments down below. So let's start way back in the beginning, way back in the 70s. Randall Smith is the founder of Mesa Boogie. And way back in the day, before Mesa existed, he played in a blues rock band in the California Bay Area. And one night, his keyboard player's amp like blew up and the keyboard player thought it was the end of his musical career because they were pretty much all broke and didn't really have a lot of money and he didn't think he'd be able to afford another amplifier. So what Randall did was he grabbed the amplifier, he went to the store, he got some components to fix the amp and he fixed it and they continued playing as a band and later on down the line his keyboard player said hey I'm starting a music store and you're coming with me Randall was like okay sure so they had the music store and one day one of the guys from Country Joe and the Fish came into the store and they wanted to play a joke on one of their band members Barry Melton they wanted to take one of Fender's little prints and practice amps and they wanted Randall to modify it so that way whenever Barry plugged in to play it, it would like blow his mind. So what Randall did was he took the Princeton, he completely gutted it, he punched bigger holes in the chassis so he could fit bigger transformers in it and he put a Fender Baseman Tweed 412 circuit inside of the Princeton. He also put the power section from the basement as well. And Princeton's at the time only had this little 10 inch speaker in it and what Randall did was he fit a 12 inch speaker in it. He put the JBL D120 which at the time was all the rage. He actually fitted in there, even though it was kind of difficult, but he got it done. And after he had finished it up, he turned it on, you know, he was making sure it actually powered on. He took it to the front of the shop and he asked one of the guys who was hanging around the shop named Carlos Santana if he would play on it. At first, Carlos didn't want to play on it. He's like, I'm not playing on that thing. It's a little bit of old practice sample. But once he plugged in and he started jamming, he started liking it, and they actually had a crowd that gathered and in the front of the store when Carlos was playing. And then when Carlos finished playing the amp, he said, man, that thing really boogies. And that is where the name boogie comes from, the amp line. The Mesa engineering part of Mesa comes from the fact that Randall actually needed more money than he was making from the music store to actually continue to build his amps. So what he would do is he would jack up old summer homes. He would put a cement foundation on them and jack them back down. And he also would rebuild Mercedes engines. So in order to be able to order parts from Mercedes, he needed a professional sounding name. So that's where Mesa Engineering came from. So the engineering part was the stuff he was doing to raise the money from the amps and the boogie section was the amps. Another thing that made the Mark 1 so special was that it had a cascaded gain structure. And what I mean by that is there's three variable knobs that you can tweak in the gain structure itself to get the tone that you desire. Randall actually discovered this while he was working on a preamp for Lee Michaels. Lee at the time was experimenting with some 300 watt crown power amps and he commissioned a bunch of different amp companies to make him some preamps. So what Randall did was he made him a preamp but he wasn't exactly sure what he would have to construct to get the power amps to handle the preamp. So what he did was he put an extra 12 AX7 tube in the gain structure so it magnified the gain 60 to 80 times. And what he did was he put those knobs in the gain structure itself so that way you could kind of tweak it. And he said that he would, Randall would later go back and he would just put hard wire some resistors in it to kind of tame it. But when he brought the preamp to Lee and they hooked it up, Lee had hooked it up wrong in the back so they were twisting knobs and turning everything up to try and get it to work. So whenever they actually hooked it up the correct way and Lee hit a chord, it was just this massive wall of high gain. And that's where Randall got that idea from, which is actually very smart because you can kind of control the gain as you want. And that was one of the very first times that the high gain amplifier had ever really been done at that time. The Mark 1 was built around 1971 and ran to about 1978. The thing about it was the Mark 1s weren't actually called Mark 1s until the Mark 2 came out. Pretty much a lot of the Mark 1s were very smaller combo amps that had 12 inch speakers in them 
and I think they made around 200 or so of them. The Mark I had two channels. Input 2 was the channel that sounded like Defender Basement, and Input 1 was the input that gave you that classic boogie lead sound, which Carlos Santana is very famous for. Reverb was optional on the Mark I's, but it wasn't present on a lot of the early boogies. Later, the Mark I models actually were available with reverb or a graphic E. Q. Then in late 1978, the Mark II came out. Now there's a couple of different renditions of the Mark II. So the very first one that came out is labeled the Mark IIA, but it wasn't called that until the Mark IIB came around. The reason the Mark II came into existence was because guys wanted to switch back to their clean Fender sound as well as being able to switch to that great boogie lead sound and that great rhythm sound. So what Randall did was he actually put in a foot switch. So the Mark II is one of the first amps that was ever set up to be used with the foot switch. It allows you to change the channel. It came in combo form like the Mark I's, but it also was available in head form, which you could hook to any type of cabinet. The preamp gain on the Mark II occurs after the tone controls, and it was actually one of the first amps and one of the only amps at that time that you could have preset gain and loudness on the rhythm and lead modes. This is super common today, but at the time that wasn't exactly the case. The Mark II's control panel was extended from the Mark I's and it included a separate master vibe control for the lead mode and various push-pull switches including pull bright, pull treble shift, pull gain boost, a separate pull bright for the lead mode, and of course pull lead. The 1 4th jack previously marked 1 was changed to just input and 2 was changed to foot switch. The Mark IIA was a great improvement over the Mark I, however it had a few flaws. The foot switching system relied on a relay which made audible popping noises whenever you switched modes. The reverb circuit was also noise ridden on some of the models. Then the Mark IIB came along and it was produced from 1980 to 1983. The Mark IIB is credited with being one of the first guitars with a two buffered effects loop. The loop was placed between two critical gain stages and it tended to overdrive some instrument level effects. It also caused volume pedals to react as remote gain controls for the lead mode. Mesa later implemented a mod that caused the effects loop to become more transparent and smooth out the lead channel, similar to the two. This also marked the introduction of Mesa Boogie's Samu class system which two of the power tubes, always 6L6s, run class AB pintoed while the other tubes, either 6L6s or EL34s, run in class A triode. In a Samu class amp, running all four tubes generates approximately 75 watts or MS of power. Running only class A tubes produced about 15 watts. Also available were the non Samu class Mark II Bs in both 60 watt and 100 watt versions. And on the 100 watt version, you could shut off two of the tubes, which allowed you to go to a 60 watt mode. The 2B's front panel was identical to the Mark II A's panel. In 1982 to 1985, Mesa released the Son of Boogie, or as it's commonly known, the SOB. The SOB was an attempt to do a Mark I re-release. No foot switching options were available. However, the AB splitter pedal could be used to select input one or two separately. SOB chassis were shared with other heads, but had different front panels. Then in 1983 to 1984, the Mark IIC was released. Probably one of the most, if not the most popular Mark series amps. The Mark II remedied two major problems that the 2A and the 2C had. It was the previously noisy reverb circuit and foot switching system had been replaced. The Mark IIC also featured a new pull bass shift on the front panel, which slightly extended the lower frequencies of the preamp, made it nice and fat. About 1,400 of the Mark IICs were made before Mason moved on to the 2C+. Then in 1984 to 1985, the Mark IIC Plus was born. This Mark C2 Plus is basically one of the most famous Mark amps ever and is pretty much responsible for that iconic Metallica sound. The 2C Plus was the last Mark II series to be built. It featured a more sensitive lead channel due to its featured dual cascading drive stage, whereas the 
2A and 2B had a single stage drive circuit. The 2C Plus also had an improved effects loop. Unlike earlier Mark II models, pedals configured for instrument level input sound could be used without the amp's signal overdriving their inputs. There is a lot of debate about this, but a lot of people say that the Plus refers to the amp having an EQ, but that isn't exactly the case. The mistake may have originated in the mid 1980s when Mesa Boogie issued their Studio 22 model and then changed the name to the Studio 22 Plus which featured improved wiring. All of the Mark II models could be made with the EQ as an option but not all of them did. A Mark II C Plus could for example refer to a 100 watt amp without EQ or reverb. One way to verify for absolutely sure that you have a 2C plus model is to call Mesa and they'll verify your serial number. Another way to distinguish a 2C from the 2C plus is from the front panel. A 2C has a traditional gain boost pull switch which integrated into the master volume whereas a 2C plus replaced that switch with a pull deep bass booster. The 2C plus is currently one of the most highly sought after Mesa amps. Whenever I think of a 2C plus, the picture that comes to my mind is the Metallica Crunch Berries 2C plus that, that they used way back in the 80s. That, that amp is awesome. Coincidentally enough, 12 factory C pluses with the switchable plus plus are known to exist before this idea was used in the Mark III, with the Plus Plus being developed further to become the R2 channel on the Mark III. Which brings us to the Mark III. The Mark III ran from 1985 to 1999. On the Mark III, it introduced a third channel, a crunch rhythm sound right in between the rhythm and lead channels. The physical switch for the crunch rhythm mode was implemented as a push-pull switch above the middle frequency control, most Mark III's have their presence and reverb on the back except for the long chassis ones, unless not desired by the buyer. The graphic EQ was also optional in either head combo format, which is keeping with the spirit of the other Mark amps. The Mark III went through multiple revisions just like the 2C. Each version had a slightly different voicing but identical functionality. non slimy class versions of the Mark III came in either 60 watts with two 6L6s or a 60 watt, 100 watt with four 6L6s in the power section. Mark III's contain either four or five 12AX7 preamp tubes, depending on the reverb option. Simon class Mark III's usually contain two 6L6s in the inner sockets and two EL34s in the outer sockets. Speaking of the Mark III revisions, let's take a stroll down Stripe Lane. So the very first rendition of the Mark III was the Black Stripe. This was in 1985. These are distinguished by either the absence of a marking, a black dot, or a black marker stripe above the power cord entry. This is where Mesa puts all of the different identifiers for their renditions right above the power cord. Most black stripes also reuse the faceplate from the Mark II C+. This resulted in the first pot being labeled as volume one instead of the later volume label. Also, the pull location labeled above the middle knob was hand etched onto the faceplate, resulting in a slightly different look than the other labels on the faceplate. In 1986, a new PC vision was was installed which enabled an additional component to be switched on when the R2 was activated. This board was reused in the purple stripe Mark III's then in 1986. That leads us to what I just talked about, the purple stripe Mark III's. This is the second revision of the Mark III and it features a purple marker right above where the power cable attaches to the amp. The purple stripe Mark III's are very similar to the later editions of the black stripe except that the lead section on the purple stripes are much closer to the lead section on the 2C+. Then in 1987, we got the red stripe Mark III ones. Again, the red stripe was denoted right, up, right above where the power cable attaches to the amp. This amp's lead mode circuitry was most identical to the 2C+, with some minor changes in the preamp, and it made it similar circuitry to the 2C+. Another PCB revision was introduced into this board and revived R2 channel was also introduced on the red stripe which forced the treble shift on when the R2 mode was active. Power circuitry and presence cap remained identical to the previous stripes. In 1988 the blue stripe Mark III's were launched which once again featured a blue stripe right above where the power cable connects to the amp just like all the other ones. The lead channel was voiced so brightly it's considered one of the most aggressive Mark 
series boogies ever introduced. In 1989, Mesa launched the Mark III Green Stripe series. This was the final revision of the Mark III, which was only available in a Samu class format. It was identical to the Blue Stripe apart from having an overall gain reduced, and it also had the wiring of the outer two Class A power amp tubes, which were switched to Pinto operation instead of triode for a 10 watt increase over previous Simo class amps. The green stripe was the final revision of the Mark III. The Mark III overlapped with production into the next amp we're gonna talk about, the Mark IV, and Mesa finally shut down production of the Mark III in 1997. For me, it seems that the Mark III was one of the longest running Mark amps, but it's also kind of one of the most forgotten. Everyone loves the 2C Plus. A lot of people love the Mark IV and the Mark V, but I, growing up, I really didn't hear that many people talk about the Mark III, and even to this day, a lot of people kind of don't mention the Mark III when they're talking about the Mark amps. The successor to the Mark III, the Mark IV, was actually launched in 1990 and was produced till 2008. The Mark IV was a three-channel amp, just like the Mark III. There were two revisions of the Mark IV. Mark IV is built from the start of production until about September of 1993, or referred to as version A, and amplifiers made from late 1993 until the end of production in 2008 are known as version B. Version A and version B of the Mark IV have a few differences. Version A has no foot switch for reverb or stereo effects loop, and the lead channel is much like the Mark IIc Pluses. Version B has switchable reverb, a single switchable stereo effects loop, and an output to drive another power amp. It's voicings are slightly altered. Another distinction in the B version is it has a low voltage power supply. One of the first times I became aware of the Mark IV was when John Petrucci was using it in Dream Theater. When I got into Dream Theater, like around 2002 when I was 14 years old, that I loved that Mark IV sound. It sounded so great, and it was so fantastic. The sounds of the 2C Plus and the sounds of the Mark IV pretty much forged my love for high gain guitar, no matter which way you cut it. After an 18 year run, Mesa retired the Mark IV and introduced the Mark V, which is actually still in production today. It actually houses nine different circuits within it. The Mark V introduced a channel assignable graphic EQ. Older boogies were equipped with this graphic EQ, but you couldn't exactly assign them to any channel that you wanted. Each channel has a toggle switch to be able to select the EQ active, off, or you can foot switch it, similar to the Express and F series amplifiers. And the graphic EQ also has channelable assignable contour knobs. The five does come in a Simon Class format, but with a twist. Really, Simon Class power amps were configured for SC75 watt operation or A15, or an increase of 10 watts when in Pinto mode. The Mark V is biased warmer to produce an output of SC90 watts, AB45 watts, or a single-ended A10 watt, similar to the Lone Star channel specific multi-watt toggles dedicated to the power amps operation. So the Mark V gives you a ton of different tone options. Then in September of 2014, Mesa launched a smaller Mark V, the Mark V 25 watt. It was a smaller two channel version of the Mark V. The output section contains two EL84 tubes, which you can be switched between 10 watts and 25 watts. It also featured a built-in cab clone, which this lets you model a Mesa cab so you can plug directly you know to the PA system whenever you're playing and the cab clone can also be used for headphones so you can play silently. Then the next year, 2015, Mesa introduced the Mark 535 watt. This one allowed you to go from 10 to 25 up to 35 watts, and it has four EL34 tubes as opposed to the two that are in the Mark 525 watt. They also added additional solo controls for independent volume switching. You can get it in combo and head farm just like the Mark 525 watt. And it also has a cap clone. In March of 2016, Mesa launched the JP 2C, which I think is one of the best amps that they have ever launched. The JP2C was a collaboration with Dream Theater's guitarist John Petrucci, and it's basically a reissue of the 2C Plus with a lot of the tweaks that John wanted. It's a three channel amplifier that of course is based off of the original Mark 2C Plus, but with two identical gain channels based on the 2C Plus's lead channels. It also features two separate graphic EQs which can be selected for each channel via mini toggles on the front panel like the Mark V has. The JP2C was also the first Mesa amp that included MIDI which allowed you to switch the different channels on the amp and I really hope Mesa puts MIDI 
on every Mark amp they make from now on because it's just, it's super easy and it makes a lot of sense. Just like the Mark 5, 25, and 35 watt, it also has a built-in cap clone. And you can also drop the wattage on the JP2C from 100 watts to 60 watts. Ladies and gentlemen, that is gonna bring us to the end of our Mark series journey. Looking forward in the Mark series, if Mesa does release a Mark 6, I kind of want them to go like a totally different direction. Pretty much all of the Mark amps kind of built off of the previous Mark series amp and they kind of eclipse that sound that the other Mark series amps has, which is really cool. But for the Mark 6, I think I would like them to keep some of the flavor that makes the Mark series cool, but you know, kind of go in a, a different direction. The Mark IV was kind of the ultimate Mark amp and they built on that in the Mark V and made it even better. I kind of want to see them take the Mark series to a place that it kind of hasn't been before. I think that would be really cool. Another neat fact that I forgot to mention way up top is that Randall Smith actually doesn't play guitar. He started off as a drummer and he plays a lot of piano as of today. And I just think it's really cool that he was able to design really awesome amplifiers for guitar players without actually having played guitar himself. And Mesa is known for a lot of their high gain stuff like with the dual regs and from the high gain from the Mark series. But that's kind of not what Randall d designed his amps to be. He wanted that great Fender clean sound. He just kind of wanted to hot rod it and get it the way that he wanted. But I guess you kind of can't always pick the direction things are going to go. You just kind of have to write them out. Now that we have reached the end, tell me which Mark amp is your favorite amp. And once again, if I got some things wrong or mixed some, something up, definitely let me know in the comments down below. But as for me, I hope you enjoyed this journey of the Mark series. I'm going to have to be out. Peace.